thank you so much for uh, coming on here I, I was really um, happy that you, you agreed to do it um, and I'm excited to talk about class issues um, and probably labor issues with you so let, let me just um, introduce um, Professor Anna Stansbury to everybody um, so Anna is uh, the Assistant Professor of Work and Organization Studies at the MIT Sloan School of Management um, and also a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, and Anna works primarily in labor um, and macroeconomics and specifically looks at like power dynamics in, in labor markets. Would you say that's an accurate summary? Yeah. Okay. So I think, so what we're, we're quite specific. We've only got you for an hour. And um, I want to maybe circle back to some of your stuff on labor markets. But what I want to focus on is this report that you released in March, um, which was about the, the lack of socioeconomic diversity of economics PhDs. Um, or I guess you could phrase it as the lack of working class economists, right, essentially. Um, so, yeah. So could, could you describe the report a little bit, the motivation for it and, and some of your findings? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and by the way, thank you so much for having me on. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and excited to have this conversation. I think it's long, an important conversation that's mm. sort of under underlooked in many quarters. Yeah. So, uh, basically, the the study that I did with um, Robert Schultz, who's a, just finished his master's at the University of Michigan, um, we were trying to document the socioeconomic background of PhD recipients in the U.S. and particularly interested in the question. Um, does economics look different than other disciplines? The reason we got there is both of us had been doing other kinds of diversity and inclusion work in economics. We actually met at a summit on diversity and economics at Berkeley, both as graduate students in 2018, I'm going to say, you know, several years ago. And I think have both been quite um, struck by the absence of class and socioeconomic background as one of the factors that was discussed or featured it's very important, I think, that we talk about gender and we talk about race and ethnicity. And this was just a third factor that we thought mattered and wasn't there. And we tried to find data on this, whether economics looks worse than other academic disciplines, as it does for race and gender. In the end, we couldn't find data. And so we figured we'd have to put it together ourselves. And that's how this study was born. Um, so we uh, got some data, which is basically... Both of us are based in the US. It's focused on the US because the data is in the US. But I really hope this, you know... Um, more data from other countries and we can compare. So the data is US. Every US PhD student takes a survey when they finish their PhD. It's part of the National Science Foundation's data gathering effort. And on that survey is parental education, the highest level of education attained by your parent, which of course is only a one measure of socioeconomic background, but helps. And so we can see, did you have a parent who had a university degree? Did you have a parent who had a a master's degree or a professional degree or a PhD. And we segment from there and look at econ versus other degrees. And to cut to the chase, we basically find that economics has a substantially smaller share of people whose parents don't have a college degree than any other academic discipline in the US and has a substantially larger share of people whose parents have a graduate degree. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really striking because it's I think it won't surprise anyone to hear that your average PhD holder in any discipline is more likely to have parents with a PhD and also, as you said, the other measure, less likely to have parents without a, a degree at all, right? Yeah. Um, but not only that, economics shapes up much worse relative relative to, to other disciplines, right? And it's actually basically at the bottom of the barrel, I think, on most measures. Yeah, it's really, it was striking. I think I was expecting to see some difference, but I wasn't expecting it to be this striking. So I can just share the the stats. So what we do, we break down into US born and foreign born PhD recipients because parental education as a measure of, of socioeconomic background is obviously, obviously going to be very different across countries. You know, it's going to depend on the education yeah. system in different countries. So we break it down. So um, for US born PhD recipients in economics, um, in the US in the last decade, 14%, so about one in six, had no parent with a with a college degree. And 65% had a parent with a graduate degree. Just to clarify for non-US listeners, a graduate degree in the US would include a PhD, but actually the bulk are not PhDs. They're things like 
a medical doctor, a medical doctor qualification, a lawyer qualification, an MBA. So you're thinking, a parent with a graduate degree, you're thinking people with PhDs, but also doctors, lawyers, MBAs, those kinds of degrees. And right, if you compare okay. that to all PhDs, 26% have a parent with no parent with a, with a college degree, 50% have a parent with a graduate degree. So that's a really striking difference. Um, and then if we break it down by field, so the NSF gives us a whole range of PhD field categories, you know, going as narrow as um, art history or different language groups. If you break it down by field and you take only the 150 or so fields where there are at least um, 500 PhD recipients over 10 years, so a pretty narrow category, economics is the worst for US born PhD recipients still. Um, it's It's got a lower share of people who are first generation college students than um, art history or classics, which are typically, you know, perceived as very elite degrees. So there's definitely a, a big problem there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, one of the stats that, that stood out for me, um, and I wrote it down because it said, um, yeah, US born economics PhD recipients are roughly five times more likely than the similar age general US population to have a parent with a graduate degree and five times less likely to have a parent with with um, no college degree at all. Yeah. Um, and one one of the things. Um, so sorry, I'm getting a little a few complaints about the audio um, oh, balance. Sorry. So mine's so you're quite quiet and I am mm -hmm. um, not. I um, wonder if I can turn up my yeah. mic. I wonder if you can turn it up on your end. My volume um, is not being very helpful, I have to say. Um, one second. Volume is on full. I think that's my mic, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've turned I've turned mine down a little bit, um, so I don't know if that helps with the balance. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, I I don't. Yeah, that I I there's there's actually not an awful awful lot I can do about it um but anyway so so hopefully that improved it slightly because i'll turn myself down and people can turn the whole thing up um okay great. okay sorry about so my no 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 i mean it's it's tricky i've still <laughs> i've not been doing it that long i'm still getting the hang of it um so yeah so so one thing that is um it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Everyone's saying it's fine. It's okay. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, you can't see the chat, but yeah, thank you for the reassurance, everybody. So, yeah, so economics um, has actually gotten worse over time, right, as well. This is another thing. So, all the, a lot of other disciplines, and there's things like quantitative disciplines, um, maths, um, all disciplines have had a problem. Maths, and, and statistics and, and science often seem to have big problems of this type, but they seem to have improved relatively over time. And economics seems to have got worse relatively over time, right? Yeah. So the first thing to emphasize, and I know this is sort of implicit in your question, but just to emphasize is that you'd expect the population of um, econ PhDs, anyone else, to be becoming more, to be coming from more educated households over time because the general population has more education over time. So we're going to expect to see the share of um, people whose parents have a, a college degree or a graduate degree rise. But what economics, so, and we see that happening in every discipline as the general population uh, has more people with college and graduate degrees. But where economics looks particularly bad is it diverges from these other disciplines. So the gap between economics and the rest of academia is widening over time. And particularly what you see is that you kind of see two divergence points. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s, in terms of year when people receive their PhD, you see a divergence from between economics, maths and computer science, and then the rest of the academic disciplines. Interestingly, not the physical sciences. Physics is, and the other physical sciences are moving with the other disciplines. Economics, maths and computer science are becoming relatively less socioeconomically diverse than the other disciplines. And then in about 2000, economics even pulls away more from maths and computer science, which was sort of start to level off in terms of not continuing to become less socioeconomically diverse, but economics continues to become less socioeconomically diverse. So something very particular to economics has been happening specifically in the last 20 years that goes above and beyond what is happening in the other quantitative disciplines. So 
I I know that economics there's there's sort of a similar story with with gender and ethnicity as well with economics. There was some progress in the late twentieth century with women in economics, and then it kind of flatlined. And then yeah. I think there's something kind of similar has happened with minority ethnic groups. Um, yeah. And and you you're a little bit cautious in the report. I think about overinterpreting it you're like you know here's the descriptive facts you go into a lot of detail you know different combinations um you know female and working class and and so forth is really interesting um but i just you know what what's going on like what is economics doing wrong here do you have any sense of that a lot of a lot of hypotheses and we, we delve into them a little bit in the end of the report but as you said we're trying to be mostly just here are all the facts now everyone go and figure out what's happening in the report um i think one of the things that puzzles me the most is why it's pulled away as you said from other disciplines on all these three metrics on socioeconomic background on gender and on race in the last 20 years and i can't i don't know if the cause of that is that economics is getting worse or that economics has stagnated and other disciplines have made more of an effort and have got better. And my sense is a lot of the, a lot of the latter has been happening, that there was a very big push in STEM, basically, mm. to attract more women and more underrepresented minorities and to a lesser extent to attract people from less advantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. But I, I think that a lot of the same kinds of policies and programs that will open up a discipline to one underrepresented group will actually help on many margins because it will be things like expanding mentorship schemes, um, considering people from a broader range of undergrad schools, um, opening up different routes that are less conventional into graduate school, things that might sort of impact many people from groups that haven't typically been represented. So my sense is part of that is that other STEM disciplines have made big efforts and econ has made as a discipline much smaller efforts, although there have been obviously some that have been very effective. Um, but then my sense of kind of why econ, why econ is is worse than other disciplines rather than the time dimension, I think there are probably a lot of factors and we, we can get into them, but some start at the undergrad level, some are about the content and how the discipline is taught. Some are probably about the navigating the professional path is quite complex in economics and there's quite quite a lot of different factors. Yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely get into those things. I, I yeah. one one question which is related to the issue of gender and race, and we actually were, were chatting a little bit before you came on the street, is you know, gender and race issues are far from solved in economics in the world, but I do feel that they they receive more attention, um, and it may be superficially, but they're more in the limelight than class. You don't you don't really see, you know, diversity initiatives to, for, for to bring working class people in to, to universities and to and to employment. Um, you, you don't really see this. So, do, I mean, do you have any sense of uh, why that is, why this relative lack of attention to class? I mean, that's a great question. And that's exactly what stimulated me to and my partner, Robert Schultz, to, to kind of work on this paper was we were frustrated by that not being part of the debate when we were um, working on these issues in the in the US context. Um, and you're right. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of the big diversity issue, uh, initiatives are focused on gender and race and ethnicity, even just the data collection is mostly focused on gender, race and ethnicity. And as you said, those are really important, but they're not the only factors. Um, I think it's probably different. The route, I mean, so I'm based in the US. I've been based in the US um, for eight and a half years. So my, I've got this weird kind of context where my professional knowledge is mostly US, but I'm obviously from the UK. So mm. have have some sense of the context here too. Um, in the US, I think class, honestly, I think class has not been that salient because um, there's there's a, well, there's the kind of prominent national conception that um, the, the American dream is real and equality of opportunity exists. And I think a lot of people obviously don't believe that and economics has been documenting that that's not correct. So I don't think that's the kind of prominent belief in economics, but I think it helps un explain why class is not as salient a part of the national dialogue. Um, but then I think in, in uh, academia, I think a lot of people have been surprised by the results I documented because there's a perception that um, university is the leveler in some sense. And so once there are obviously major socioeconomic disparities in access to university, but once you've got your university degree, 
then it's a leveler. And so then seeing big class disparities into different PhDs, all from groups of people who've got, you know, the same caliber of university degree. I think that was surprising to a lot of people. And that basically the fact that it hadn't been documented was um, was causing it not to be looked at. Obviously, in the UK, the situation's different because class is much more salient in the national debate here. And mm. so why it's not been a focus here, I say here because I'm currently physically in the UK, um, yeah. but the so it's it's a bit more of a puzzle to me as to why it's less um, focused on in diversity initiatives. Yeah, I mean, the easy answer, and this is too easy, is that it's a bit more difficult to measure than than the others, I think. Um, and, and like yeah, you said, you sure. use parents' degree, um, which is like available to you. It's a perfectly good measure, but there are other ones you could use. You could use parents' income. You could use parents' yeah. occupation. And maybe there are some measures that don't necessarily have to do with parents as well, right? Um, there, there's right. lots of different ways of thinking about it, whereas with gender and, and ethnicity, it's, it's probably a bit more straightforward. But but that's the easy answer. I think um, it's just it's it's lazy, um, and it's been a real blind spot for economics, especially um, as you've shown, but so so many disciplines for a long time. Um, and so you mentioned something there that I want to talk about. So just delving into these results a little bit more. Um, yeah. So you you talk a lot about the the mechanisms through which this happens, right? So the the education that people get and how that feeds into uh, where they end up going and whether they end up doing a PhD. Um, and so and you talk about the kind of explained versus the unexplained parts of of the class the class gap, right? Um, so could you maybe unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um... Actually, and one thing I want to uh, mention as well is the class gap is is not just an absence of working class economists. It's it's also an absence of sort of everyone but the top, um, if that makes sense. And I think that's important mm -hmm. to emphasize, too. It's like we're missing a lot of perspectives in in academic economics. And we're also underrepresenting the perspectives of people who came from uh, middle class in the American sense, kind of middle income families um we, we're really just over representing people whose parents have graduate degrees you know so the very top of the education and probably also income uh distribution although we don't have income so yep. okay so you asked me about when we break it down so what we try and do is we try and, and break down what portion of the difference between economics phds socioeconomic backgrounds and the other disciplines is to do with different factors so we can do this by running a regression just very simply where the dependent variable is one zero um, as to your, you know, whether your parents have a college degree or not, or whether your parents have a graduate degree or not. Um, and then adding different controls and seeing how the coefficient on economics changes, which tells us how different economics is from the average across PhD recipients. So if you just look at US born PhD recipients and just look at um, whether or not your parent has a college degree, a university degree. Economics is about 15 percentage points um, lower than the other disciplines. So it's 15 percentage points, 15 percentage points fewer, 15% uh, fewer of econ PhD graduates have a parent with a college degree than the average PhD. Um, that's just completely raw. You can then add controls for things like um, undergrad institution, undergrad major, and PhD institution. So that's basically saying um, to what extent is econ's disparity starting at the undergrad level with the kinds of majors that people are picking? Uh, maybe already people from less advantaged socioeconomic backgrounds aren't doing econ undergrad degrees. And so then the pool of people from whom PhDs are going to be drawing is already going to be more privileged than the pool of average undergrads. Um, you can also look at the undergrad institution. So that's the idea is there is other kinds of universities that economics PhD programs are drawing from, do they on average have more privileged student populations than the average university that a PhD student comes from? Remember, in all of these, we're conditioning on some PhDs coming from there, because it's obviously true that on average PhD recipients are coming from more privileged undergrad institutions. But we're saying econ relative to other PhD recipients, are they coming from disproportionately privileged institutions? And we so we find that about two thirds of the gap between economics and the average um, PhD can be explained by these factors that are coming from undergrad level and PhD institution level. 
And then about one third is unexplained. So even if you're saying the same undergrad major, the same undergrad institution, the same PhD institution, economics PhDs are still about five percentage points less likely to have a parent with a with a college degree. Yeah. So I can break down. Oh, I, yeah, no, sorry. no, carry on, please carry on. Yeah. yeah. So, so I can break down a little bit more and dig in a little bit more into the undergrad major and undergrad institution because we were able to also look at those directly. So you can get data from a different survey. It's not it's not a kind of our PhD data is a census, which is amazing. We have everyone. <laughs> I mean, we're basically everyone. It's something like 90, 93, 94 um, percent. You can get a survey of undergrads in the U.S., um, so not a census, there's some risk worries about sampling error and things, um, but where you look at the parental education of undergrad, undergrads by different majors, and it does look like already at the undergrad level, econ already is more socioeconomically, has more socioeconomically advantage students. So they have relative to maths and relative to other social sciences. We can't tell if that's happening within universities, because one thing we also know is that in the US at least, um, the big private universities are more likely to have a big economics major than the public universities. And the private universities have obviously a more, a wealthier, more advantaged group of students on average. So we can't tell exactly why this is happening, but we know that economics already at the undergrad level is somewhat more privileged. So that's one of the factors that is definitely contributing is something's going on at the undergrad level when people are choosing majors or schools. Yeah. The other so, thing is so that when you oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, I just want to unpack it because um, there's there's a, yeah. I guess there's a lot of information for the viewers, and I wanted to just yeah, so yeah. it's basically the case that you're, you know, say say you're a, a working class person, um, you're already less likely to to get a degree, um, but you're then less likely to get a degree in economics, um, and then suppose yeah. you get a degree in economics, you're less likely to get one from a private university, right? Um, and then so basically, you know, at every stage of the way, you're sort of filtering out people into, you know, institutions that are either um, not not doing economics or if they're doing economics, they're less well regarded. And so they're le you're less likely to carry on with your study if you go into them. So there, it just seems like there's this whole sort of funnel. Right, that that takes people who are already privileged and funnels them through all the way through, and they go to the you know the top unis, the ones that um, that offer economics, the ones that offer you know economics PhD programs, the ones that have links to the to the other top unis, and you just end up you know reinforcing the the whole problem, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great description of it. It does feel like there's a there's a funnel with multiple barriers at multiple points. And I think one of the big questions is, why is that funnel particularly narrow for economics? What are we as a profession doing to make it so narrow? And where is that choice coming? And I think, you know, one of the questions is that economics, you know, who's t who's taking an economics degree versus who's taking different degrees? And why is that? One of the questions is also what schools are being recruited from for PhDs. So we find um, we look at uh, we look at Ivy Plus um, undergrads in the U.S., which is Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Uh, I'm not going to list. There's eight Ivy League schools, and then we yeah. add four more that other researchers have added, which is basically you know very very prestigious, also very elite, also very uh, privileged student population schools. And then we look at just the rest the rest of the private school population, private university. Then we look at public universities and. Obviously, there's big variation within these groups, but on average, the most privileged student body is the IVs, and then the private, and then the public group, just, just being very broad yeah. brush about it. And we see that economics is really disproportionately bringing its students into PhDs from private universities, and particularly from these IV+, even compared to other, other PhD subjects. So that I find quite puzzling um, in the sense that there's not, it's not, it's not obvious to me why that should be the case. And, you know, some people propose that there's more hierarchical nature in economics than in other disciplines. And some people propose that we are relying more on sort of recommendation letters. And so it's really about networks and who the professors at different universities know. But I think that is a, an obvious place where this panel is narrowing, which is if we're drawing more from the schools, which are Ivy League schools, and so have mostly very advantaged student population, obviously that's going to create a very um, privileged PhD student population and there's also also an obvious you know fix for that yeah so yeah I mean I, I made a video about the 
co- toxic culture of the economics profession. Um, and one of the things I talked about was this kind of hierarchical system, because it does mm. seem that economics more so than other disciplines, again, has this this focus on, for example, the top five journals, um, the top, the Ivy League departments, as well as other top ones from across the world, Oxbridge and so on. And, um, it, it, you know, they're only recruiting from certain places uh all the way you know down to the degree level and then they only kind of recruit their phd students from each other um and it just results in this very exclusive club basically right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So- sorry karam yeah no i was just gonna say um there are some excellent researchers doing work on studying uh, sort of the the hierarchical nature of academic disciplines. I don't know if you mentioned this in your um, your last video on this, but they it's uh, Aaron Clauze and Daniel Larimore and some others, and they are um, measuring the hierarchical nature of a of a discipline as a network measure, which kind of captures the degree to which you only move up ranks. Uh, sorry, sorry, down ranks and never move up ranks at each level of the progression. So from PhD to first faculty job, from first faculty job to second yeah. one or to tenured one and so on. And I was corresponding with them by email after my paper came out. And they said that in this work, they find that economics is almost uniquely hierarchical in the sense that people almost never move quote unquote up rank, um, which is a suggestion of exactly the the mechanisms that you talk about. Whereas in other disciplines, there's more moving around different um different universities and different schools and I mean we can talk a whole separate nature about whether rank is a meaningful metric but if you just just using that as a measure I think it's interesting to show that there's this incredibly hierarchical nature that seems to happen at every step of the academic kind of promotion process and just to reiterate it's uh, the, the statistic have I, I got it right it's 65 percent of economics PhD recipients had at least one parent with a graduate degree right yeah, in the USA, sixty-five percent. Yeah. That it's an extremely high number of second-generation academics. So, I mean, yeah, I, I just to, just to interject, yeah. it's not second-generation academics because a graduate degree can include um, like an MD, JD, MBA. Oh, yes, so okay, more, okay. The PhD okay. figure I can pull up is is twenty percent, but oh, it's, it's still very high, yeah, relative yeah. to the population. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I, I think it, it's interesting. To, to think about I guess some of the things that happened so we've talked a lot about the whole pipeline of the profession I suppose there are some pr- prior and maybe subtler things that are going on before education right so if you think about the household right and and the family um, there may be some things going on with you know what children are encouraged to do what they you know what they believe they can do what options they're aware of you know i mean i'm first generation academic um and it you know the idea of a phd was all very alien to me i didn't even really know what it was to be honest when i was when i was growing up and that's the same for most people i know um and so just all of these things um that seem to entrench uh the you know academics to become academics or people with graduate degrees to to be more likely to have children who go on to get graduate degrees so do you have um yeah do you have any idea of how those things operate and the role they play yeah i mean this is something where we can't get at it with our data obviously so it's just more you know discussion based on other other research and other knowledge and other experiences but um i'm i'm very sure that that plays a role and the question where i always get stuck is why does it play more of a role in economics than in other areas than in other subjects because you know if you assume people are uniformly not informed about what a phd is and not aware that it's a it's a path that they can pursue why does econ look worse and so i think i have a couple of ideas and i'd love to hear your thoughts as well one thing one idea that i think is quite plausible is that um if you're choosing an undergrad degree you might be choosing something that is uh, seems 
more directly linked to a like a, a good career or profession and so economics might not be on the radar as much as like maths or computer science would be on the radar or engineering or something like that um and so then you know that that choice has already put you on a path that is not an econ path and then if you're on the maths or computer science path and you decide that actually you're exposed to research and you like the idea of a phd and a mentor approaches you and suggests it then you're kind of on the path already in a way that you're not if you're if you weren't to take econ and then i think the other the other way that it intersects sort of why econ specifically is um probably it matters a lot more if you're not aware of that path to have the path be open and transparent and to have people actively making you aware of it right making you aware of the option and making you aware that you are capable of doing this and you can do it if you follow x y and z steps and i think econ is quite intransparent in how you get from an undergrad to a PhD. And I also think we don't have that much in the discipline on the whole uh, in the way of active solicitation and mentorship and encouragement of people to go and, you know, take this academic path. It's more, um, you know, if someone wants to, they will find their way to it and they will come and ask whoever faculty member for advice, but there's not that much active promotion and solicitation and seeking out of of, of good students and suggesting this path. And I think that will matter more for students who wouldn't have necessarily taken that path on their own because they wouldn't have um, necessarily, you know, wouldn't have been on their radar. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in what you think though. Mm, yeah, I mean, everyone knows what maths and science are and even what psychology is and what geography is. I feel like economics is probably up there uh, and like you said, we don't have data on this, but uh, I, I'd make a, an educated guess that it's probably up there with the subjects that people know least about i, I mean you must have yeah. this as an economist right people people just don't know what what no. you actually do they're like oh do you how do you make loads of money can you help me with my finances and stuff like that and you're, you're like yeah. no i'm terrible at managing my finances what well, i am anyway <laughs> um and you know it has nothing exactly. to do with economics um as we study it right so you're right like people don't know what economics is and it, it can feel quite distant i think um and i think like um yeah when you ask children i actually know this because that the charity economy have, have uh, done some work with children and when you ask them to draw economists um they draw things like men with top hats and monocles standing on top of the world and like they um they sort yeah. of uh or they draw the economy as like under a bubble over westminster and it's all just very elite and very mysterious right so yeah i think there's definitely something to that and i think i guess what's relevant to what we're talking about here is the economics profession seems to be fairly <laughs> happy with that and fairly inactive in in communicating like what what exactly it is we we do yeah i think there's a lot of um inertia uh on that and it's interesting because um this has been a, a prominent conversation topic in terms of trying to attract more women into econ at the undergrad level has been maybe um well not maybe i mean exactly fitting with what you said about these school students uh drawing pictures surveys of incoming um incoming university students in the u.s so they don't have to pick their major right they pick their major in the u.s when they're already at university so you survey incoming university students and ask them for their perceptions and you know people very very know very little about what economics involves or if they do they think it's about finance and the stock market and banking and you know which obviously some portion of it is but only mm. a portion <laughs> um and so uh there have been a bunch of really interesting studies where they redesign either redesign the intro economics course itself or um, just kind of design a bunch of information packets to send out to people to say, look at all these interesting things economists study, um, look at all these interesting people who are economists, so sort of showcasing both the diversity of people who are economists and the diversity of topics that economists study. And they found big effects on enrollment of women of underrepresented minorities and of first generation college students in econ um, 101 classes and in the econ major so it does strike me that this this information channel is important and also is kind of quite easy to to to, to act on yeah that's that's i mean that's that's really encouraging um i think yeah so that that kind of leads me to something which is mentioned in the report and which you mentioned earlier what 
things about economics. So let's assume that somebody knows about economics, right? They've got the information pack. Um, but what thing? What about it? Do you think might deter people from from working class backgrounds or other other kind of disadvantaged backgrounds? So this is where I get into a lot of speculation, obviously. Uh, but we, we we have to because we can't always have hard data on everything. Um, hmm. So uh, I think there are a couple of aspects of the way the way the discipline works in terms of how we think about things, but also particularly the way it's taught in a lot of intro courses and undergrad courses, which sort of distills those essences. Um, so for example, one thing is, um, I think starting undergrad econ by taking this incredibly 30,000 foot level view of how economic decisions are made and what economic decisions are, um, can just feel incredibly irrelevant and removed and unrealistic from the kinds of questions that people maybe came into economics to study. And that can be true of people across any kind of background. I remember feeling this in undergrad and doing a whole lot of a whole lot of differentiation, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> doing a lot of differentiation and Robinson Crusoe choosing between whatever he was choosing between fish, working and rest and people choosing between guns and butter. And it all felt very removed from why I had come into economics to study it. And, and I imagine that if you're driven by questions that you've experienced in your life, and that might be disproportionately true for people who have experienced economic hardship, for example, then um, then it's going to feel particularly removed and particularly unrealistic. So I think that's I think one aspect is, is where we start is not really connected to the really fun, interesting, juicy, important parts is important tools. We need to learn them. But the way that those tools are presented is often not very um, connected. I think the other is um, which which set of models we start with. And I think it can feel like starting with the rational, perfect competition, perfect information benchmark of the world, and then introducing the market failures and the government failures and things later can also feel a little bit unrealistic and divorced from what happens, you know, because it's a little bit of a Panglossian view of the world, you know, the second welfare theorem, it's all great, um, <laughs> as long as markets are working and, and the initial endowments is the issue. Well, that, that's a really big issue. <laughs> like initial endowments is a huge issue. That's kind of the root of many of our economic problems. So I think part of it is the, 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 the benchmarks. And then I think part of it is just the language. Um, and that probably comes from a deeper root. But I think using terms like low ability, low type, I mean, they're just, they feel to me obviously offensive as well as, as, well as in, incorrect as descriptors of people who have less education, which is how they're typically used, right, in a model. Um, so... I think those terms are, are offensive and are probably feeling disproportionately offensive to people who feel like they're being described by these terms or people they care about are being described by these terms. So I think it's a combination of all three of those things. Yeah, they're, they're all really good points. I've heard, I've seen people um, say, who are maybe from more working class backgrounds, that the focus on choice in economics is kind of like laughable for them you know the idea that you know choosing work and leisure right that was an example you gave like oh i'm going to i'm going to work 17 and a half hours this week and you know spend the spend the rest in leisure i mean it's kind of laughable for everyone to be honest but like i think especially for for someone um who just doesn't have that much choice over the job they do over how they do it and over what they buy they're kind of forced by necessity and it's kind of ironic because economics 101 says it's about scarcity but maybe yeah. doesn't really investigate poverty uh you know and, and there's a lot of modern work on poverty and the effects it has on people which which is just completely absent from this framework yeah i think that's a great point i think that's a great point and i remember feeling i guess yeah it's partly about the focus on choice and then it's partly about where that where that um kind of choice mindset is applied because I remember feeling particularly appalled when I first learned about the, the the school of macro models like real business cycle models that basically posit that recessions and the unemployment they cause are a result of people choosing to take more leisure and you just think what world was this conceived in so yeah 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Do you, do you advocate getting rid of um, real business cycle theory models from the curriculum? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. there's <laughs> probably. I mean, yeah. so, so the the kind of you know the fundamental building blocks. If you need to teach people micro founded macro, then yeah, start from there. But by like, don't start from a model where unemployment is a choice that people make in recessions. Clearly, the Great Depression was not a collective choice of lots of Americans just not to work. Yeah, and I think the issue is if you teach it to undergraduates as well, you know, at the very best, your best undergraduates are going to get that basic model, right, I think, and that's all they'll be able to learn. Um, whereas if you introduce it maybe at graduate level and you're like, by the way, this is all wrong and we'll we'll move beyond it later, it might be a bit better. But sometimes I feel like you end up with that really basic model because mathematically, you can't expect undergraduates to go much beyond it. It's pretty complicated, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but then that's how you walk away with this kind of like, um, yeah, a little a little economics is a dangerous thing, right? <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, so a related question, right? So I'm really interested. So th this is all, <laughs> we're getting much more into the speculative bit, but this is, this is the fun bit, really. So we've discussed some of the barriers um, within the discipline. How, how do you think the discipline might change were we to have more working class economists? So obviously, for me, there's, you know, there's an inherent fairness issue here, right? There's an issue that there are barriers working class people face that, um, I don't want to say upper class, people from a higher socioeconomic status uh, don't face. But um, what, um, how would it substantively change, you know, the questions we ask as economists and how we focus on them? And I mean, you, you know, you could probably reference your own research here because I know you've done some research on, like we said at the beginning, power and, and labor markets. So, yeah, what, what would be the effects of more working class economists? Yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, even if there were no effects, there'd still be an equity fairness case sure. to to improve things. And I think there's also just in any discipline, in any profession, there's an efficiency case, which is, you know, assume talent for different things is equally distributed across the population, which I do. Then there's a whole bunch of people who would be great economists who are losing um, by by having these barriers to access. So it's just a general efficiency argument and that applies you know, to gender and to race as well. Um, but then in terms of economics specifically, I think the big issue is we're a social science and social science, you know, we're not studying atoms that behave in, well, I don't know if they behave in predictable ways because I don't really know enough about quantum mechanics to, to, to <laughs> opine on that. But so humans, humans behave in ways that are very, very nuanced and complex and depending on context. And it's really, really hard to see that context and that nuance uh, from the outside. And so I think having people who've had different lived experiences is really important to study those situations because you're going to get different perspectives on those lived experiences and on how people make decisions within them. And that every single economic question is coming down to how people are making decisions, essentially. Um, you know, subject to constraints, not about choice per se, but how people are behaving and how their actions interact to create the economic outcomes that we see. So, I mean, you, you can just pick any economic topic and think about how this would matter. But as as some examples, um, like one example that would come from my work is I've done a bunch of work on um, non-compliance with the minimum wage mm. and in both the US and the UK. And I think this is something that surprised me and I think it surprises a lot of people and I don't think it surprises anyone who's worked a minimum wage job, which I haven't, that there's all sorts of ways that employers can be non-compliant with the minimum wage that are going to be really hard to see, both for the both for the worker and for an inspector or for the enforcement agencies or for a survey. You know, things like getting people to um, clean up after they've clocked out after of their shift or getting people to pay on their own dime for buying protective clothing or buying the uniform that they need for work, which might which bring their net salary below the minimum wage or paying people by the piece, like, you know, per hotel room that you clean, you get paid a certain amount and that doesn't add up to the minimum wage. There's all sorts of ways that minimum wage non-compliance can happen that are quite hidden and not that obvious. And I think that kind of thing if you or your family member has been in that situation is very obvious. And mm. if you haven't, it's very not obvious. And so you might just go your whole career studying the minimum wage and not knowing that until or unless other research or other people were, were giving you that information. So that's that's one example. But there's, you know, there's so many other areas. So for example, 
a big topic that, I mean, a very directly related topic that economists study is about access to education and, you know, uh, what information do people have when they're making choices about university and what uh, financial constraints do people face and how do different programs like student loans or um, government funded programs and financial aid, how do they affect these decisions? And you can obviously study that with data, but if you have if you have gone through this process or have family members that have gone through this process, you're just going to have a much more nuanced, nuanced kind of contextual awareness of what the big constraints are and what the big factors are. And it might lead to different research questions and um, different approaches. And so I think, you know, we're probably missing a whole range of things, questions, answers, context, nuance, priorities um, because of that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's they're both two really good examples. I think it's easy to have the view from above if you haven't i mean i haven't worked a, a minimum wage job really um either and i think so you've got you've had for a long time and this is goes back to the barriers within the discipline you know you've had for a long time first you've got the people who say minimum wages are really bad um and you know maybe that's not very appealing for people who work minimum wage and don't want to see their wages lowered even more right but then i think you get even the more pro minimum wage economists I think you do get this tendency and it feeds in with these abstract models as well, where they just like, oh, we'll just put an intervention in. Here we are. The government intervenes and then we pass this policy and then and then the problem solved. And what you're saying, right, with this minimum wage enforcement research, as well as some of your other stuff on wage theft and various related issues, is that you can't just pass a law from the top and, and think that think that the problem's solved. And anyone with experience of working those jobs will know that, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, yeah, and it's. I think it, it kind of, it forces you. I mean, I spoke about this. Ben Harrell, who you may know from Twitter, is, is in, in yeah. the chat. Um, I spoke about okay. this, this with him uh, in the context of LGBTQ economics. And I think one of the things, I, I do find that the kind of methodological and, um, let's call it demographic diversity, often tend to go hand in hand because you start to look at things that people haven't really looked at and you start to say well why isn't there any data on lgbtq people or why isn't there any much data on wage theft and things like that and that forces you to you know engage with issues of like power you start to recognize oh what we study is partly a product of like existing power structures and the nature of the discipline um what data is available and it also forces you to do things like you know get off your ass and go and like speak to people because you don't just have an easily downloadable data set right so you actually have to go out there and into the real world um so is that is that something that you've done a lot by the way like something that i really advocate economists going out and like actually speaking to to real people who aren't economists yeah oh a lot a lot in there and also hi ben in the chat um really big fan of, of his work so that's cool to hear about that yeah, on the on the kind of power and what we study, I completely agree. And this just becomes more and more clear to me the longer I am in the discipline. And I try to be cognizant of that because obviously once you're doing the studying, you are in a position of power yourself and have to be, you know, careful. But um one way that that really came clear to me was actually, funnily enough, doing this project on socioeconomic background. Um, the NSF collects this survey on PhD recipients and to ask the parents highest of level education. The question it asks as follows, what is the highest level of education of your father or male guardian? What is the highest level of education of your mother or female guardian? And they changed it only in the last few years, I can't remember the exact date, to allow for two same-sex parents. And you just think, wow. even the data we collect is, you know, so recently is reflecting these um, these these biases and power structures in a way that, in a way that is not only problematic because you can't, um, study groups that you you need to be able to get data on to understand what's happening but also it's just it's just incorrect <laughs> i mean <laughs> yes. it's just bad science not to not to allow an option um for same sex parents so it was sort of troubling on both counts um but in terms of going out into the world i completely agree and i think this is where i mean this is where i try i don't think i do enough but i do try because i agree with you that it really matters and um particularly i'm someone that that is studying topics of which I don't have that much personal experience myself or in my family. Like I came mm. from a background that's relatively advantaged and my parents, um, my parents are lawyers, like or were lawyers. Um, 
so when I'm studying the minimum wage or something like that, like I, I really acknowledge that I need to get out there and understand. And I try and do that partly by talking to people and partly by also reading qualitative research, which I think is something economists could do a lot more of on average, because there's a lot of really yes. good um, work in sociology and anthropology where the entire um, the entire research endeavor is trying to distill and gain kind of big picture insights from these incredibly in-depth conversations or ethnographies. And so I think that can also be really valuable kind of doing both. Um, so I just, yeah, like interviewing people, understanding what the kind of big barriers or, or constraints or sources of, of um, problems are in their work lives is something that I try and do alongside my research just to sort of inform it in a big picture way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah, I, I, mea culpa as well. You know, um, I I research topics that I don't necessarily have that much direct experience of. I I tell myself that doing YouTube videos is uh, reaching out to people, but it's not really like I need to. I need to actually yes. go out into like communities and and stuff. Um, so um, yeah. So one thing that this, this made me think of. So you're talking about interdisciplinarity, right? And just in my head, this is all this is, is all very linked, right? Because what you're talking about is what I think some economists, maybe not the younger ones, probably more the old guard, they would regard it as kind of maybe softening the discipline, right? Uh, making it less scientific, less mathematical, less statistical, and they would think of it as maybe not real economics. But I think in terms of inclusion, you can have things like, I don't know, um, affirmative action, and you can have, you can send out information packs. But I think if you really want to bring people on board, you have to abandon this image of economics as a really hard science, because I think that's part of what makes it really exclusive, and maybe part of the reason that other disciplines have done better. Um, so I don't, I don't know what you think of that, if you agree. Yeah, I don't know if I agree. <laughs> so I kind of, I kind of agree on both of them separately, but I don't know if I agree with with how you brought them together. So I just as a kind of methodological preference would really like the the set of methodologies which economics accepts as as sufficiently rigorous to be wider than it is. Um, I really think the emphasis on very rigorous causal causal inference is, is good. And I think the emphasis on clear mathematical modeling where you can identify exactly what relationship is being specified and which parameter affects what is good but I just think also other methodologies are good too and we can learn from them so I'm kind of very pro more methodological diversity I'm also very pro you know diversity on on, on background and identity but I don't know if it's true that methodological diversity leads to more background and identity diversity because econ is less diverse than very hard sciences so it's not necessarily clear to me that that's um I think you probably could get more background and identity diversity by following the playbook of math and computer science and physics and other other science biology and other sciences, which are hard sciences that have a very specific certain set of highly quantitative methodologies. But I think it would be also good for the discipline if we did the latter. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good comparison point, actually, that, that maths and, and science have done much better. So um, maybe I'm talking shit. But um, so what, one thing I want to uh, one thing I want to ask sociology is, is better, so yeah, 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 still. <laughs> yeah, sociology is better. Yeah. Um, but so one thing I want to ask is in terms of pushback, I kind of implicitly characterized the pushback there um, that you might have got. Have you had any kind of counter arguments to to your findings or to the idea of increasing inclusion um in the discipline and i know that nobody would probably people probably wouldn't phrase it the way i just phrased it but what kind of pushback have you received on this yeah so i think um the biggest question that people have who are not um convinced by the idea that it's a problem for individuals is is this coming from um choice and and the the, the it goes something like this uh people from less financially advantaged backgrounds are completely fairly going to be more focused on a career where they can um make decent money academia either isn't that career because it's you know it's later until you make money and it's more risky or isn't that career at all depending which country you're in um and what the university funding system is like um and so 
the kinds of people that are interested in the kinds of topics that economic studies have really, really well paid good career options that are not academia in the way that someone who's a historian or a sociologist doesn't. And so that would explain why all the people who are kind of interested in economics will go off and work in finance and data science and have good, well-paid careers rather than academia, whereas people who are really interested in history don't have that many other options, so they end up going into academia. And so I think there's a, there's a question of, is what's happening because of barriers and problems, or is it because of choice and options? And if it's because of choice and options, then it would actually be less good to try and bring more people from less advantaged backgrounds into econ academia, because it would be diverting them from what would have actually been their optimal choice. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest the biggest pushback that I've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. I, I mean, I suppose that doesn't. I mean, I have some thoughts on that. Um, I, I'm sure you do, too. That doesn't necessarily mean if you're talking about a complete lack of awareness like we were earlier, I would say. If you you know, if you can't see the whole choice set then you're not making the optimal choice, right? Um, so it violates yeah. the axiom of completeness, like in, in technical terms, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so, so that, that would be one thing to say. Um, but um, another thing which chimes with something else that I believe somewhat independently is you could, you could maybe pay junior academics a bit more, <laughs> um, like, because it is a badly paid uh, career path, at least, you know, for the first bit, I think, uh, for a lot of people. Um, but then that, is itself something that could be changed but i mean i, I don't know what what do, what do you think of um of that argument yeah i really agree on the information thing i think that so many of the problems are coming from i i think are likely to be coming from information and therefore it's not going to be an optimal choice and i also think a lot of it is coming from um what one can do with the tools of econ not being how econ is taught as i sort of discussed before at undergrad level and that's also kind of mm. partly an information thing um but so so my general response is, well, at the very least, we can do lots more on information and lots more on transparency and lots more on uh, support and encouragement and mentorship and seeking people out and telling them they have these options and telling them they're an excellent student and therefore, you know, consider this. And if they don't consider it, great, then they're making the optimal choice. And then we can figure out uh, <laughs> whether we do other things as a discipline. But there's so many things we can do there um, that that it's that it's sort of. We don't yet have to decide whether it's choice or not, because we can still do so much on the barriers and information first. I'm sorry, I forgot the second half of what you said, though. Uh, I, I was thing. basically whining about being underpaid, but I was just oh, saying, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I, a fair point. No, I mean, I think that's I think that's true to a different degree in different places. In the US, it's less true, I think, because mm. US universities tend to have more money and so mm. pay better. But um, but I think it's I think it's probably true at the PhD level everywhere. Yeah, I mean, a PhD is not a particularly financially secure path to go down and my you know my phd was funded but they i was kind of lucky in wh where i was in the country at the time it was quite available and it, it's yeah i think it does seem to be i mean academia always has been to an extent right something for people with cushions with safety nets to be able to indulge in almost right um and i i just i wonder you know the the counter argument that you described doesn't seem to recognize that that itself might be a problem right right i agree with that and then i suppose that the the question is you know if it is an optimal choice is the is the right answer then for us to make academia more attractive um yeah so that yeah. it becomes the optimal choice for more people yeah yeah no yeah. i agree with that Absolutely. Um, there's there's one thing which might we might be circling back a little bit, but there, there's one thing which we didn't touch on r with regards to the statistics that you gathered in this report. Oh, yeah. So we were talking about we've kind of talked about working class and, and gender and, and ethnicity as if they kind of overlap quite a lot. But but that's not always the case. And I think it's especially not always the case with foreign born um, PhD students. Right. So that's one thing that the, the report looks at foreign born because there's i think it's a majority of phd students in the usa are actually foreign born right um yeah, so they is, is. are ethnically diverse but they're not necessarily diverse in in the sense of class right yeah absolutely so uh, again with the caveat that parental education means different things from different mm. countries and contexts but we see that even among foreign born phds 
So economics is, is a very, very international subject in the US. 70% of, of econ PhDs are foreign born and kind of more than 50% overall of PhDs in the US. Um, but econ is still the least um, socioeconomically diverse in terms of parental education of the foreign born students. Um, and it's particularly so if you segment my continent of birth, it's particularly so for students coming from Europe and students coming from the rest of the Americas. Actually, econ is kind of in the middle of the pack for students coming from Asia and Africa. Um, and so it's 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 an issue there as well, particularly for for whoever's coming from from Europe and the Americas. And I'd say interestingly, econ is actually not that um, it's it's very it's gender problematic for the US. It's not that gender problematic for foreign born students, um, particularly for students coming from Asia. So a lot of economics PhDs in the US who come from Asia are women. And that kind of really brings up the female share of the overall PhD population of econ. Uh, in the US because US born econ PhDs are very disproportionately men. So there's interesting intersections between gender and race there. The other intersection I would talk about quickly, if you don't mind, is um, even among the US born students, I think it's often, it's often perceived that um, if you're talking about first generation students, you're talking about uh, ethnic and racial minority students. And that's, I mean, disproportionately, yes, that is true. But on average, that is not true in the sense that the bulk of first generation college students are actually not from a racial ethnic minority, they're white. And so you've got an interesting, an interesting um, intersection where if there's someone who's from a racial ethnic minority and is a first generation college student, it looks like in our data, they are facing sort of double barriers. They are even more underrepresented than either of those groups, but also even first generation college students who are white and who are male are still very underrepresented. And so what I think this also shows is that there's, there's a really important intersection, but we shouldn't forget that the people that are not in the intersection are still underrepresented. So we've kind of got to focus on all of, all of these issues at the same time. And I think focus less on um, people who actually are overrepresented. So for example, white women with parents with graduate degrees like me, I don't think we need to benefit from diversity initiatives. I think we are probably overrepresented. We, we are overrepresented. And I worry that there's a kind of focus on people who are already on most dimensions pretty privileged uh, at the expense of maybe people who are who are less privileged on other dimensions. Yeah, wow, that's 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 amazing that you think that actually, um, that you phrase that <laughs> so starkly you don't don't need any um assistance. Um but the the yeah, so I mean the worry is right, and you, you hear this quite a lot from on on the right of the political spectrum i think as well and i, I feel like sometimes it's disingenuous but you, the worry is that you get a bunch of um kind of basically fairly privileged people who are nevertheless gender and diverse in terms of gender and ethnicity but if you didn't focus on class which goes back to what we we're talking about at the, at the beginning that would you, you would think you'd solve the issue but actually you haven't because you've got a bunch of people who while they may be different in some respects are all the same in another very important respect right yeah i absolutely agree i couldn't have put it better myself and i think you know whether who, who that critique is coming from may affect whether it's disingenuous or ingenuous <laughs> ingenuous yeah, but, um, so that's definitely but I think, the way i think yeah, exactly. I think I think it does matter. I think that's exactly why I focus on class matters as well. Yeah. So so um, Anna, we've hit uh, five o'clock, which yeah. is when you said you could go until. I will just say, um, ask you one final question, which yeah. is, um, it's going to be one like three questions disguised as one question. <laughs> but what what would you like to see done in this area most in terms of research, um, and in terms of actual action um and maybe you could talk about some of the stuff you're doing in, in this area as well yeah oh uh, good questions so i mean i think in terms of research it's just wide open i mean everything needs to be answered every question that we discussed today there's a lot of research on um on on class and socioeconomic background in academia as a whole not as much as i think there should be but there's a, there's a kind of growing body of work but looking at it in economics specifically and how that differs from other disciplines and why there's just very very little and so i think part of it is understanding the undergrad level um you know are these speculations that we put out true about why people are choosing an econ undergrad or not and people's perceptions about what an econ degree involves and the options, the career options that it can lead to, you know, is it correct to think that people aren't choosing economics PhDs because of 
uh, lack of information versus because of a lack of mentorship versus because of uh, good other options. You know, all these questions are things we need to study. And I think also just documenting socioeconomic background more systematically and including it in all of the other diversity research is important. So, for example, the American Economic Association did a climate survey that was really, really good survey and really systematic and a huge response rate trying to understand the climate for professional economists um, in the US. And they they issued a report with race and gender breakdowns on all sorts of things. You know, it was pretty dark stuff. Like I talked about women not, you know, privileged white women not needing protection. But there's some things where obviously the gender does still matter. You yeah. know, sexual yeah. harassment prevalence, um, even sexual assault prevalence, like all sorts of really horrible things related to gender and race and ethnicity and sexual identity, sexual orientation as well in this report. Super important report. There was no breakdown by socioeconomic background. Now, those kinds of things, mm. it would be so yeah. easy to include and to analyze. And I think that's just a, 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 an important data collection effort. So the research side, there's so much to be done on that. And I also think research wise kind of testing interventions, you know, a lot of um, this is a particular area where the people that conduct research are also in a very privileged position to be able to conduct research easily, which is, you know, many of us who have econ PhDs and care about this stuff are at academic institutions where we can actually intervene, you know, change the way a course is promoted and mm. see what happens or change the way a mentorship scheme is implemented and study what happens. You know, we can pilot intervention, study them, share that information, and then hopefully that kickstarts um, a lot more effort in the profession. And that sort of gets to the second part of your question, which was what we can do. Um, and I really think there's a lot of a lot of areas of leverage. Uh, part of it is the information front. And I know there's a lot of groups doing actually cool stuff in the UK on this, on um, on going to high schools, right, to schools. So mm. I, I switch between US and UK vernacular, going to schools and um, and and talking about what economics is about and various different ways that economics affects your lives and, you know, relating it to really important things like whatever we're seeing inflation right now or uh, the economic support schemes during the coronavirus pandemic or unemployment or financial crises. Um, doing that at the, at the school level and then doing that um, at the level at which people choose their degrees. So in the UK, that would be in A-levels and in the US, that would be at the beginning of undergrad. Um, outreach bucket then there's the kind of bucket of um support and mentorship and i think this is really important and i speak as someone who like really really benefited from this i'm only in this profession because uh someone reached out to me after a class that i took with them and they had a policy of reaching out to all the students that did well in their class and said hey come for a meeting and i went for a meeting and they said you seem really interested in economics. Have you thought about a PhD? And I said, no, and, but that planted the seed and that mentorship, yeah. you know, ended up, ended up leading me to a PhD. So I think really active, conscious mentorship from individuals, like we can all take that on ourselves, but also schemes and systems that specifically provide opportunities and provide, um, a, you know, information as to what research is like, but also maybe little research assistantship opportunities. So you can try it out and, um, support on how to do the applications and how to prepare your 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 CV or your transcript what other courses you need or what um what kinds of grades you need to get for applications and how to be strategic about it and where to get funding if you're applying for PhDs that aren't always funded all those kinds of things i think would be really valuable mentorship schemes and there are some of these but just expanding them you know more funding more people um being mentees more people being mentors mm. uh and then the third bucket i would say is re is is this um, effort to redesign and rethink undergrad economics, I think is, is, is really exciting and important in that area. I think the core econ project is very exciting on that regard. And there are a few other, other efforts which tailor the course to really center the kinds of issues a lot of people have come into economics to study and then give them the tools to study them rather than start with the tools and then, and then get to the interesting issues later. Um, centering models of you know imperfect competition and centering consideration of inequality and poverty I think would help and then I think there's a there's a fourth bucket which is at the graduate admissions level if we're talking about PhDs and at the graduate school level um, trying to consider more people beyond the usual suspects whether that's the usual you know schools or the usual people that recommend other people taking some risks basically because I think the reason that um, PhD admissions are really 
drawing from small sets of, of schools is because you know what you're getting. You know, you know what a given grade from a given school means. And you know what a given recommendation letter from someone means. You know, if someone you've never heard from before says this is the best student I've ever seen, but you've never seen any of their other students, you don't know how to calibrate that. Mm. And so I think you have to take, you know, you have to take more risks as an admissions committee. But in doing so, I think on average, the profession is going to bring in uh, more people. And then, of course, once they're once they're there, you have to give them the tools and the support to succeed. And so that means more uh, conscious support and mentorship and you know within the PhD programs as well so that was a, a long spiel but those are the four buckets that I think all matter yeah that was a that was a really comprehensive answer thanks very much yeah it always astonishes me how infrequently we as people who have done PhDs recommend doing PhDs to our to our good students it, it just it's yeah. really so rarely happens and, and you yeah. just just say to someone who's got an 80 in an essay um, that's high in the in the UK. It's not high in the states, yeah. but yeah, or a hundred yeah. in the states. Yeah, <laughs> say say to someone, "Hey, have you ever considered doing a PhD?" Like, it's amazing how infrequently that happens. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so um, thank you so much um, for coming on, Anna. I really enjoyed this, and we didn't chat about labour economics as much as maybe we could have. But um, yeah, I, I'm so happy that you um, came on to talk to us about this. Thank you so much. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate you having me. Lots of food for thought. Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks very much. See you. Thanks. Bye.